Okay. Uh, well, I'm Steve Kane. I'm currently working at Kingston University, but I'll be retiring next year. So uh, being an independent troublemaker, pardon me, scholar, uh, from that point on. And what I want to talk about is not so much that, um, not, not just credit card debt, but actually any debt it ends up being paid for by the poor, but the poor are the workers. And I want to show you the logic behind us. So my um, claim to fame here is that I built a model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis back in the uh, early 90s. And one thing which was, uh, it was trying to simulate the idea that there can be a financial crisis driven by too much debt. And that's simply what I was trying, trying to build. And one thing I did not expect at all was the phenomenon you can see here. This is the wages share of GDP going down. Then there's a period of, um, and this is the employment rate. And you can see this, it's, it's, this is over a ridiculous number of years, 800 years. Okay? But what you've got is a period of very high volatility, long period of stability, and oh hell, what happens here, and then a breakdown. So that was quite a fascinating, unexpected, what's called emergent property for me. And when I graphed it in three dimensions, it, uh, it looks even weirder. I'll talk about it in a moment. But I've since realised that I can actually derive this model from strictly true macroeconomic definitions. So if I define the employment rate, the wage share of GDP and the debt to GDP ratio, and then I differentiate those with respect to time, I have a set of literally true statements. Okay? Cannot be objected to because if you've got to object to definitions which are true. So um, these three statements are the employment rate will rise if economic growth grows faster than labour productivity plus population growth. The wages share of output will rise if wage demands grow faster than growth in labour productivity. And private, this is pretty obvious, but it's, a, it's one that actually last occurred to me when I went through the mathematics of my model. The private debt ratio will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. Okay. Those are all factually true statements. To make it into a model, what you have to do is make assumptions, and you can't avoid assumptions in modelling, much as I might criticise the ones neoclassicals make. Uh, you have to make assumptions to link the various system states, as they're called, in this model. And the rule in complex systems work is you make the simplest possible assumptions you can. So what I'm assuming is no uh, Ponzi finance, no how borrowing by households. Okay? But I want to show you what happens to households. So I have investment being motivated by the rate of profit, but I've got a linear function linking the rate of profit to the level of investment. Wage demands are motivated by the level of employment. It's a classic Phillips curve, but again, unlike Phillips' own work, it has only one causal factor, which is the employment rate, and it's linear. Both of the things he said were not the case with his own theory, and nobody ever reads the paper, so they don't know that, and they wonder why their models don't work. Um, and then debt is incurred by firms whenever their desired investment exceeds retained earnings, and if desired in, uh, investment is less than retained earnings, they pay debt off. Simple, fairly simple uh, assumptions. Now, what you get is a model that generates rising inequality as a byproduct of rising private debt compared to GDP. And it's quite uh, remarkable because there is no borrowing by workers in this model. I've done other models where I include workers borrowing. They crash even faster than this one does. Okay. Um, but it, it's the, that, that's, 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 in that sense, I regard consumer debt as icing on the cake, where the cake is the probability of a financial crisis in a capitalist economy. So... Um, what I have is an incredibly stylized model, and what you get out of it are three, poss two possible, three possible situations, two of which are realistic because one of them involves negative wages share and negative employment, which doesn't happen, obviously. So what you get with a stable one is this rising level of private debt fluctuations, and then it settles down. But when that continues growing, actually I've chosen the... the um, I had one more slide I've actually knocked out of the presentation. This is a rising level of private debt that does not slow down. And what you get coming out of it is rising inequality. If you graph the incomes of workers, they cycle down. The income of bankers rises up fairly smoothly, then starts to cycle. The income of capitalists fluctuates around an equilibrium, or so it appears, until the system breaks down. So you get a constant profit share. Their income is unaffected until the crisis occurred a rising share for bankers, and a falling share for workers. Now, that's pretty much, you know, that is rising inequality. Now, the logic behind it is that the, both the model and capitalism itself are driven by profit. And so the rate of profit investment depends upon the, the rate of profit. 
and profit is what you have left over after you've paid wages and interest and raw materials costs and a whole range of things I'm abstracting from in a simple model here. Uh, so what, what happens first of all, you have investment, and this is a stylized version of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis here. Investment takes off at some point in the economy, leading to a rising level of debt to finance investment because you now because you've got a high rate of profit, you're borrowing money to finance investment in excess of retained earnings. That causes rising banker's share. There's a high level of debt, therefore, even with a constant rate of interest, you're paying more to the bankers. And worker's share also starts to rise once the boom gets going, because after some point, you're above the level where workers can negotiate wage rises. And therefore, you get because there's three classes in the social system, if banker share is rising and worker share is rising, then profit share is falling. Now, when that happens, of course, investment goes into a slump. And when investment slumps, the economy slows down and it will then recover on the other side. Once you've restored the profit share, then it inspires capitalists to want to invest as much as they own and then start borrowing again. But this happens with a high level of if invest, so investment restarts with the same level of profit as in the initial point, but there's a higher debt level. They don't pay the debt off completely. And the reason for that is quite simple. You incur debt during a boom, you're paying it off during a slump. Your cash flow is not what you expected, therefore you don't pay as much off. When the next boom starts, there's a higher level of banker's share, but to get the same level of profit share that started the whole thing, you've got to have a lower worker's share. Okay, so it's actually a very deep emergent property. It doesn't involve rapacious bankers. These are bankers financing genuine investment. It doesn't involve households being reckless. Okay, it's an emergent property of a complex system in which we live. And funnily enough, the model that I um, built was originally based on one verbally described by Marx, completely out of character in the particular book, Capital Volume 1. Uh, but he ended up with this wonderful statement. We know he spent most of his dotage trying to learn calculus to do this model himself. He never got there, but that's what he was doing. He said, to put it mathematically, the rate of accumulation is the independent variable. The rate of wages is the dependent variable. He's spot on. He didn't do the maths, but he was damn right in his in intuition. So what you get is a rising level of rentier income, and that's fundamentally what banking is. You can see it, landlords, anybody who earns income out of the fact that they own something, not out of the fact that they're producing something. Uh, so that gets bankers but get the first claim, workers get the residual, and as debt rises, workers are the ones who pay for it. And at the moment, we have the highest level of private debt in human history. Maybe not human history, capitalist history, but probably human history. This is the level of the United States and the UK, and you can see the boom, that was actually deflation in America during the Great Depression, driving up the debt ratio, even though the level of debt was falling. Then you had the dramatic fall in private debt during the Second World War, and bang, up you go again. I expected a similar pattern for the UK. What I found was the UK's debt level had a few ups and downs, as you can see, but it never exceeded 75% of GDP until after the election of somebody's name I haven't got down here, but I think her name's Margaret. And then you had a huge increase in private debt until a guy called Tony got an election win because of a recession. And then under Tony, it went up. And poor old Gordon was in control. I think it was a Gordon or who was the Prime Minister? Mm -hmm. Pardon me being an Australian here. And then down you've come and now you're going back up a bit. Notice that. Okay. So when you look at what's happening, I see private debt as driving the whole caboodle. It's the, it's the element of capitalism which is left out of main, mainstream economics, and that's why they didn't see the crisis coming. So this is looking at the relationship between mortgage debt now, so I'm, now I'm talking household debt and actual statistics, and house prices. And you see there was an uptrend in debt. In debt it went from the level there starts at 60% uh, of GDP, roughly, for the um, level of household debt, flatlines for quite some time, and then from the 1980s on, rises quite substantially, reaches a peak after the financial crisis and then declines, it's now rising again. That's what we're talking about today. Sort of similar pattern for house prices, but the causal relationship, as I explained in other research, is between the change in mortgage credit and the change in house prices. And mortgage credit is new mortgage debt. So what you've got is a relationship between the acceleration of mortgage debt 
and the change in house prices, and that is astronomically high. Okay. Now, according to mainstream economics, this correlation is zero. According to anybody who's got a spreadsheet, the correlation is about 0.7. Okay. And what you get, and funnily enough, and this is another peculiarity to the UK, it isn't just the households have been borrowing, it's corporations as well. And they're pretty much matched each other. That is unusual. Most other countries have got fluctuating business uh, debt at a breaching a peak back in the 1980s and not going much for half it with but rising household debt. The UK has managed to combine the two, which is a very special achievement. Now, when I take a look at the relationship between the change in private debt and the level of unemployment, again, I get a correlation which mainstream economists tell you is zero and the stats tell you is about 0 0.6 or 0 0.7 minus 0 0.6 or 0 0.7 for un between the change in debt and the un unemployment rate, about 0 0.7 between change in debt and the employment rate. And I think I've got one more slide here. No, let's see. No, I want to go back. I'll just go back. and So that's the similar relationships apply in terms of change in private debt and acceleration in private debt and change in employment. But what we've got, uh, and this is the thing which I found quite remarkable when I first plotted this data, the data has only been available since the crisis because the Bank of England went back in time trying to reconstruct historical data series after the crisis. So they built... The, they took what uh, ONS had started with an uh, analysis of the level of private debt in the UK, which, by the way, was only a certain claim to fame here. It was only the statistician only started doing it because he's reading my papers. Okay, so that's sometime in the 2000s is when you be Britain began recording the level of private debt, and then the Bank of England went back afterwards and built a whole time series. I think you probably know about it called "What Can We Learn from 300 Years of Financial Data." Excellent data series, of course, they've got all the records there. And this, this is what I, what I found a simply stunning chart about the ratio of private debt. I've shown it to you a moment ago, but I want to show it more slowly. What's happened to private debt since 1980 in the UK? Here's 1880. There's 1980. And you can identify the time at which that increase began to a couple of years after the election of Margaret Thatcher, barely even that when I think the fundamental change was the deregulation of housing lending because that meant rather than building societies doing the lending and building societies take money from Joe and give it to Mary, okay? When you put in a building society, it is not creating money. But when banks lend, it creates money and that creates additional demand for both goods and services and assets. And you have what you've gone through is an incredibly fast rise in private debt from 55% of GDP to 191% up here. You've since come down to about 160% and it's now rising again a bit. And that is fundamentally what's driving the economy, not Brexit, not the devaluation so much. That's the fundamental driver, which is ignored by mainstream economics, at which point I'll either take questions or hand over to Yonah.